Welcome to The Exchange. I'm Dan Riley. The Exchange is a streaming internet talk show and podcast of interviews with noteworthy people about their lives, ideas, and current events. This week, I sit down with University of California, Berkeley, Haas School of Business professor Solomon Darwin. During our conversation, Solomon talks about the history of the caste system in India, his family's experience as untouchables, and the egalitarian school that he created in his native country to educate underprivileged students. Welcome to the show. I'm here today with Solomon Darwin, a professor at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. He's going to talk a little bit about his life and his background and his academic career. And uh, Solomon, first, thank you for taking the time to uh, sit down and talk today. Um, and I want to start by sort of going over what we were talking to before we started recording, which is a bit of your personal and family background. If you could just start to talk a little bit about where you come from, where your family comes from. Um, it would be a great place to start. Very good. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I grew up in India. I grew up in a remote village. Uh, the village is called Mori. It is in a region of India uh, at one time where nothing grew because it was salty soil. Uh, because of that, the untouchables of India were banned or um, put into this area called uh, Konosima. Uh, and many untouchables. Untouchables are people in the are subhuman beings. They, in the process of reincarnation, because of the karma at birth, they are marked as untouchables. So the jobs that we were given uh, is to clear the dead bodies and to do the clean the public toilets. We are scavenger caste. So we uh, are. Uh, we are supposed not to be seen, so we are kept in these reservations. So if I were to cross into a, a high, higher caste uh, uh, village, uh, it's bad luck for a uh, higher caste person to look on my face or to touch me. It's, uh, that's why we are called untouchables. They, con- they get contaminated with sin. So a high caste Hindu will, um, will return back to his home and restart his journey because it's bad luck because he ran into me. So we are put into these reservations, and that's what our ancestry represents. Mm. And we're also given names like pigs, dogs, and our last names are always like, our, my last name is Leech, so a bloodsucker, basically. So we even often, we are even uh, embarrassed about our names. So I come from that village, and, um, and uh, um, my... Um, it's it's a long story, but I will make it short. Um, uh, the reason that I uh, um, became successful, I would say, is primarily because of the efforts of my grandmother, mm. who was uh, given away as a child bride when she was uh, six to a man who was 20 years older than her. Uh, she was one among ten. She was born in this village. Her father couldn't afford her. Uh, so in those days, they either gave the babies the girls. Girls are liabilities. Mm. And either they gave them away for temple, prost- uh, uh, temple prostitution or as they call the maidens of God as an offering to the priests. So around the temples in India, we have these women, young women, mainly that the priests use and help themselves to. Or they gave them away in child marriages uh, to whoever wanted them. My grandmother was married to this man 20 years older than her. She was a house slave and went through a lot of persecution. And uh, over the years, she's a beautiful uh, woman. And so the husband, uh, the the man wanted her, but she was not bearing children till the age of 40. Mm -hmm. And so she was finally beaten and thrown out. And she went back to her dad. And her dad said, uh, you bring a curse to me. Uh, if you stay in my home, because barren women are um, supposed to be cursed by the deities. Mm. So uh, in India, we never invite a barren woman to any social occasion mm. because it's a curse to that occasion. Mm. Mm. I don't want you. And so so she said, I'm going to go and uh, throw myself in the river and commit suicide. I have no hope. My society doesn't like me. My husband doesn't like me. My in-laws doesn't. Even my father doesn't want me. So there's no sense in living. Mm. So she drowned herself in the river, and um, 
uh, an Englishman on a bicycle saw uh, my grandmother and he pulled her out and uh, and he said to her and he realized and heard her story and the first thing that he said was he put confidence in her, in her. he said you're not worthless you're, you, you can be a blessing mm. to a lot of people mm. you have a lot of potential so he took her under her under his wing and he also brought the husband back and he put both of them under his protection uh, he happened to be an english missionary mm. as he's a young man in his 20s and he learned the local language and uh, he and so he taught both of these people how to read and write mm. and the untouchables were denied educational privileges medical privileges mm -hmm. so if they were caught reading or writing they would be persecuted mm. actually a generation before that uh, my grandmother said they put uh, hot lead in their ears if they heard uh, scriptures mm. at the temples mm. or the cut of their tongue if they were caught reading books. Uh, so so in that society, it was uh, so after she learned how to read and write and my grandfather learned how to add and subtract, mm -hmm. um, they were more ostracized mm. and uh, more death threats. Mm. So for the first time, uh, my grandmother thinks about you know, India is not the only country that we need to be enslaved in the system. And she heard about people escaping to another country called Burma at that time, where there's no caste system. So she's a very um, collaborative woman, and she had friends, even in the high caste and the low caste. So she got some funding, and she goes to Burma with her husband. And because of these tools that they have, uh, empowered with education, how to read and write, and, and my grandfather becomes a clerk at the port or a mm. shipping yard, mm. and he has several hundred people reporting to him because he was a payroll clerk, and he kept the records, mm. and my grandmother saw that as uh, being away from India, persecuted environment, she was relaxed for the first time, mm. and she conceived my dad, and my dad was born in Burma. Interesting. And we're, I'm taking him there oh, this month. <laughs> to go to go and focus in on the history of the caste system, how long has it been around, what are its roots, and where is it today? Ah, oh, very good. good. Good question. It goes back to uh, very um, uh, roots of Indian culture, the Indus Valley civilization. Mm. Uh, when the Aryans came to India, they saw these uh, uh, natives, and they instituted this caste system. Uh, I don't think it's even a part of Hindu religion. It's just that it was a very convenience to keep certain people low mm. because they needed a lot of jobs done. Mm. And um, and they made it, uh, they built a religion around it and uh, Hinduism embraced it. And uh, it's a karma, the concept of karma rightly aligns itself to this. Interesting. So an, a good untouchable will come back in his next life if he did his prison sentence well. A little bit, uh, maybe not a leech, but maybe a little higher, maybe a dog, mm -hmm. and he will move up the ladder. Is the history of that caste generally unquestioning obedience, or is there also a history of rebellion against the caste system in some form? I'm, your grandmother is probably a, an, in, uh, an example of someone who did rebel to some degree, but... Did most people just fall in line with the structure yes, of the society? They, they fall in line. They fell. They fell in line primarily because they're all Hindus. Yeah. My grandmother was a Hindu, and she believed she deserves her state. And every day she would worship a different deity. Uh, that her curse would go away, and uh, and she was a very deeply religious uh, Hindu. Mm. Uh, but she also believed in this caste system. She mm. believed in karma, mm. meaning that I deserve this. Mm. It's almost like a prisoner accepting the fact that I'm guilty and I'm deserving. I'm just serving my sentence. Yeah. So there were not too many people who questioned. The reason that Obama began to have a different process is this because this white man comes over and he says, hey, you're created in the image of God. Uh, you're not some worthless person. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, you, if I teach you how to read and write, you can be a blessing to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And, and that kind of thought never entered into her mind, so that introduced some disruption. Right. 
Yeah. How about, it, with the Hindu caste system, I mean, generally systems of oppression are designed with different categories where individual people at the top are controlling the power, mm -hmm. um, have, a, have an interest in keeping the power as it is, economically, socially, whatever. Is, was that also the case in the, historically in the Hindu caste system, that there, was, there were wealthy elites, there were powerful elites somehow? Mm -hmm. And how did they maintain that grip over... The lower classes, maybe it was just superstition. I'd love it's not superstition. That. What it is is that the deity, the Brahma, from his head, the Brahmins were created. From his shoulders, the warriors, the ruling caste, the kings, Maharajas were created. Hmm. From the waist, the businessmen were created. From the feet, the servant caste were created. But the untouchables were on, on the soles of the feet at the bottom. So when the when the deity dances, mm. he's dancing on the untouchables, mm. on the feet. Mm. And that's 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 how it is. And, mm. and it's a part so ingrained in our thinking and society, even now. Uh, I mean, let me take you, you know, today. I have a school for the untouchables. Uh, but... When we opened, when my wife and I opened the school, uh, the people who lined up, because we built a beautiful school with uh, internet and everything, the people who lined up in front of my school were all the high caste Hindus. They wanted to, their children to go to this class, to the school. And I said to my wife, who's, who's, who's white, and Amy, she turned around and said, well, maybe we can do the Robin Hood method. Maybe we can charge these people <laughs> and pay for these people. Mm -hmm. Okay? And... Uh, and and uh, that didn't last for too long, mm. okay? Right mm. now, uh, at one point, we were 90% high caste Hindu in our school mm. because they wanted it so badly. Mm. But once we started implementing our policies, like uh, the parent would come into the classroom and said, I don't want my child sitting next to that child, right? And they said, I'm sorry, this is uh, equal. Right. When I go on the school bus, as soon as the high caste kids get into the bus, mm. the low caste kids get up and they give up their seats, they sit on the floor, and the high caste kids sit, sit in. Mm. So, and so at one time I said, stop the bus. And I was just visiting uh, from the United States and I just wanted to go on the bus ride. And I asked the driver, what's happening? And why are people sitting on the floor and some people are doing this? He said, well, because th these guys work for the parents of those guys. Mm. These are untouchables. That's not what the school is about. So I stopped the bus. I got all the kids out. Go back. First come, first served. I got 100 admissions gone that, that, that day. Mm. So now, uh, so today, that's today, right? So it's still happening because 80% of our Indian population still lives in rural villages. Mm. And where this identity is mm. very, very strong. Is it still strong in the major cities? No, it isn't, because the cities, everybody gets lost. And we don't know who your neighbor is, it's like here. And people change names, you know, uh, even though even though in cities, people still don't mix. Mm. There's no intermarriage, mm -hmm. uh, unless, uh, you, know, uh, you know, now we're having these love marriages and all of this and and so on. But that's happening in cities. But it's still a taboo. Mm. You mentioned the internet, and given the, from the time the internet was invented and became commonplace to now is a very short period of time, given human history and the history of India, are things starting to change there, would you say, as a direct result of the spread of information, or are things changing quite slowly or not at all regarding the caste system? Uh, well, uh, what amazes me is that there was an article written about me uh, when I was a professor at USC, an uh, India West, an Indian magazine, and uh, that, you know he's an untouchable professor and so on, and I got hate mail from Indian community. Well, how dare you do this, right? Uh, so what happened? And and the school that we built in India, uh, most of that money didn't come from. Uh, none of it actually came from the Indian. Uh, I have a couple of friends, so good friends of mine. Who, who, who gave to the mission, but uh, but majority didn't come from, from them. What is it like for you to, to live in the United States? I mean, is there anything even remotely comparable for you 
that you notice in the United States in terms of the way our classes are are segregated? And what was it like, particularly at the beginning when you first came to America, your impressions of oh. this place? When I first came to America, it was a culture shock. Uh, as I said, you know, I I came from a dirt floor home, uh, of uh, in my, you know living in a mud hut to beautiful San Francisco, and uh, and uh, it's like coming to a paradise. Uh, but that went away very quickly after a month, where I had to realize I had to go to school. I was seventeen. Right. A fifth grade education. Uh, too embarrassed to go to a school. And so I said, I'm not going to go to be a, the biggest boy in the class. So I went to Skyland College applied, and uh, and they said, we don't take your application because uh, you're, you, you, we don't recognize those certificates or anything like that. And then I didn't have any certificates. Uh, um, I learned, kept learning the same thing in this little mud hut school I went to. Didn't learn much. So the lady said, okay, um, uh, uh, come back tomorrow, we'll give you a test. And so I studied very hard, and they gave an English comprehension test, and uh, I got 35 out of 100. And she said, you flunked. So I had tears in my eyes, and I turned around and walked away, and and she called me back, and uh, and she said, well, we'll take you on a probation. So the first year, I got uh, a lot of Fs. I do Ws, uh, Ds. Uh, and I was doing very, very poorly. I took a job as a janitor in that school. And so so when the dean introduced me uh, a couple of weeks ago to the student body, uh, I first thing I said to him, I'm just so honored to be here because this is a place where I thought about, uh, thought about committing suicide. Life is not worth living, um, and uh, I can't make it. And uh, and I said, uh, Mr. Dean, if you look at my transcripts, uh, you'll be very ashamed of me. But I said, I'm here today to tell you uh, as to what helped me to get through life. And I told him, uh, just about five, four years ago, I was sitting with the world's richest man, Warren Buffett. Uh, I was uh, invited by him to his home to spend a day because the University of California Berkeley wanted to give him an award, the most prestigious award for um, distinguished contributions. He said, Solomon, I, I don't go to universities anymore to receive awards and things like that, but you can come here. So I represented our dean, uh, Dean um, uh, Tom Campbell, uh, who was our uh, dean at the time. And so I went down and uh, one of the things I asked him, what made you successful? Because you come from humble beginnings. And he gave me eight things that made him successful. He, he says, these are responsible for my success. None of those have anything to do with, uh, you know, what my students would call a formula or a stock analysis uh, model or anything like that. It has to do with, the first. there are two things that he said uh, that I identified with. And it happened to be the first two. The first one was, I had a great role model in my life. And I said, who was, he? Who was that role model? Was it Abe Lincoln or who? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, well, you wouldn't even know who he is. And he said, he actually is my father. Uh, no one knows about him, but he is my idol. I, he gave me encouragement, courage to move on in life and do things. And he turned around and asked me the same question. You know, you're a, a professor at Berkeley, and what made you successful? Then I had to reflect on myself, and uh, and I said to him, you know, uh, it's I had a role model too. It's my grandmother, and uh, she came here at the age of ninety-eight, um, and she died in my home when I was uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, and she died as a result of an accident. And uh, I was uh, vice president and corporate co controller of Glendale Federal Bank, which is the third largest savings bank in the country at the time. We did business in all 50 states. I was just promoted, and she died after visiting my home. Uh, she couldn't handle the fresh paint in the new home. 
uh, the, that we had, and so we got asthma, and the doctor mismanaged her, and she was in and out of coma. And they called me to the planning conference and said, yeah, your grandmother wants you right away. I think she's going to die. So I ran, ran up to the hospital, and she says, I want you to take my body to India and bury me there. And I said, I don't think I can. I'm sorry, because I the planning conference is my first chance, first break in my life to be something big. So I came to home back to my desk, and I was sitting there, and, uh, and my secretary came in and said, why are you sad? I said, well, this is what happened. And so she spoke to a few other secretaries, and finally the secretary of the president heard, and she went and told the president. So Keith Russell calls me into his office, and then Mr. Solomon, I, if your grandma's dying, I know it's a critical time for us and for you, but we'll give you two weeks on the house, and we'll pay you to go and take your grandmother's body back to India and come back. So I make, I take this coffin, on three different airlines, I know, and uh, then finally we get India, put it on the train, then we put it on an ox cart, then on, and then we finally go to this river where she once uh, wanted to drown herself. And, um, and, um, and, um, on the other side of the river, they had a put two canoes together to put this metal object. And on the other side, I saw these hundreds of people waiting with the musical band, firecrackers, and everything else. And uh, I began to feel that this woman in this casket is very, very significant to those people. Hmm. And, and they take her, they, take the, they insisted on carrying that object two miles inland, uh, and they wanted to carry it themselves. And even though, I, even though I had a bus ready to wait to take it, and the crowds grew larger, you know, and the you know, and the band was came, and, and then and you know, there was I still with a beard there, this a young man taking this coffin, and this is a home, uh, and all these people waiting, and uh, it was the longest funeral service I ever attended. Mm. Started at eight in the morning, ended at five, mm. and uh, it's the stories that I heard. Right. That house is the first tile house built by an untouchable against the wishes of the landlords because they were supposed to be in mud huts. But she built it, and that house was burned down seven times and rebuilt because she was a disruptor in that society, took a stand. So, you know, all these people that were there and, um, and telling testimonies were people that were birthed by her because she was the first midwife, learned how to deliver babies, uh, read literature from England on how to hygienically pull a baby out. Mm. She named them. She built a school and educated them. Uh, she started many, many businesses, many businesses in Burma where she went to. When she saw her husband's uh, uh, leadership of uh, several hundred people who worked under him as customers, and she invited them for a free lunch to her home. The food was great. They said, we'll pay you. She becomes the largest uh, restaurant owner in that part of Burma. Mm. Tons of money came in. Mm. Then she started adjacent products, uh, lunch packets, food to go, uh, make your own meal, uh, in a food stand, uh, you know, different... Uh, uh, pickle, different assortment of pickles. Mm. The money was so good, people began to trust her, and she was a good un entrepreneur, social entrepreneur, because she knew that her husband is in charge of payroll, so she would deduct the money before we she paid the guys, so which means no receivable problem. Mm. People trusted her too, so they put money with her and said, you know, keep this money with you because I know it's safe. Mm. So she dug a little ground, big hole in the ground and put all the money there and she realized I have so much money I can lend it out so she started a bank. So uh, so that bank, Credit Union, also grew and we mm. made money like that. But to move from, from her escaping into Burma, having her first child, to you leaving that part of the world and coming to the United States, yes. how, how did that happen? And, 
someone in your position born as an untouchable going from <laughs> the the likelihood of you being able to even get out I would imagine and come to the United States were almost zero yeah, yeah. how did how did that process happen what's that story yes oh very good uh, after the success in Burma uh, all the wealth disappeared overnight it just went up in flames World War II she not only started those businesses she made so much money that the high caste landlords in India back home became her friends because money can buy enemies and they started shipping their products to Burma where she resold like the textiles and mm. so on. Mm. She also bought land, first untouchable to buy land in India because for amount of money she gave, oh, price, maybe a hundred times more than what they, it was going for, mm. she could buy it. Mm. So when she came back through that World War II, she, her, when they were bombing, they had to leave as they were into the jungles. They ran into the jungles. She had a three-month-old baby, my uncle, uh, who's now a doctor, uh, she was holding him, dragging the, the other three children into the jungles. For three months, they disappeared. And in the jungles of Burma that were so thick, uh, a lot of wild animals ate people. Bombs killed other people. They were walking and ate bodies. They were like, uh, like skeletons. Finally, after three months, they make it to the shore and take the last boat. And it was shipwrecked and lived in refugee camps. And finally, they come back home to India. Uh, walking and she was powerless she lost it all she came to a place where she was hated and still hated she has to start with nothing it's at this time when the that the death threats now did not come from the the higher caste they came from her own caste because they lost jobs because of them uh, because of uh, their um, involvement. At this time, she conceived, the, she thought something beyond the borders of our country, the continent, into a product that she would introduce into England. She goes to White House and she says, I have a business proposition for you. I'm a very artistic, talented woman, and here's the product. Just market it. It's a, a view, uh, it's lace that is done, artistically done, because the raw product uh, in Mori was cotton mm -hmm. threads, very cheap, but it's, it's in the talent. And if you can sell it in England, you'll save my life. Mm -hmm. So he sends a few samples. In three months, he gets orders and thousands. So she starts a cottage industry, and she becomes the largest employer of women in exporting lace to England, and she got paid in pounds. And all these other people who hated her because they had side businesses that benefited from this, they also began to collaborate. Mm. So the money from the business, she sends her kids uh, to private schools. My dad was 12 at the time, going to school, first grade. Um, and then she starts a school herself. Um, and she starts, uh, this is before everything went up in ashes. This is her at the height of her prosperity, all decked out with jewelry and everything else. My grandfather uh, in Burma, taken in Burma. Uh, this is the feeding program after she starts the lace business because she wanted to, and she adopts uh, a lot of kids uh, because the landlords abused beautiful, untouchable women as dirt and whether they're married or unmarried, doesn't make it, made it a difference. They would just come into them, go into them. There were all these babies born. N neither party wanted. Mm. So she took them in. And uh, it was called a House of Refuge. And this is the school that she first built and taught of herself. And it's the school that I went to uh, till the fifth grade um, because uh, the government wouldn't appoint a teacher there. Mm. This is my dad. Uh, he's the first man to get a PhD as an untouchable in South India. And uh, this is my uncle, the doctor, the thoracic surgeon in Arizona. Uh, both of them prospered, not in India, but after coming to the United States. Because after he got his PhD, they wouldn't uh, give him a job. The British left. 
the British influence wasn't there. But my dad discovered that uh, most of the PhD thesis was uh, graded by an international team of scientists in marine biology. So one of them said, why don't you apply to the US? So he went to the library, bought all these university books. And so I remember as a kid, a uh, 10 year old, uh, I think 12 maybe I was there at the time. Uh, they'll put, uh, I was licking stamps, putting it on all these envelopes, sending it to America. We got hundreds in, hundreds came back saying, I'm sorry, we can't accept you. After two months, one envelope came, isolated. My dad said, I'm not going to open it. My grandmother said, open it. We don't know. God works. This happened to be from Scripps Institute of Oceanography. It's the number one research institution in marine biology in the world. If City College of San Francisco and San Jose State declined, why would this one take me in, right? So he opens it, and it's a letter from John D. Isaacs. Uh, he said, Solomon, we are impressed that you applied. Uh, you know, it so happens that happens to be my specialty, and, uh, and I want to invite you to come to Scripps. So that is a break from moving from there to here. Mm. And so he was here for four years. And uh, then after that, uh, he came and brought us to the United States. That is the bridge. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with this whole thing about the American dream. And when I came here, I didn't find the silos of bondage. Oh, you can't cross this street, go over there and talk to that person. When I came here, I could talk to the smartest kid in the room in my class. And that's how I learned, is uh, because I'm getting Ds, Fs, I would identify the smartest student in the room and invite him or her over to my home for curry and rice that my mother would make. <laughs> and that collaboration of breaking down those silos, of getting their knowledge they had into my head. Mm. And then I also taught other people, I had a lot of other students like myself uh, from Mexico and other places who are equally having a hard time. So I taught them, so I learned better. Mm. So it is to that process that I moved on because my grandmother was a collaborator. She mm. worked with people, mm. high caste, low caste. She thought beyond the box and she envisioned things. And so that has been the best role model that I had to move on mm. and to conquer. Mm. It sounds like you're you're involved in trying to help those who are still in that caste system, who are still over there by building the school and trying to get them, help them educated, help to get them educated. Would, is it your general recommendation, in addition to getting educated, that they leave India for another country, maybe even especially the United States? Or do you have a general, another rule or uh, piece of advice that you would give people who are, who are currently untouchables in India, who are becoming educated, mm -hmm. learning about the world and want to have a better life? Well, I think this internet and globalization is helping breaking down those silos, uh, which is a good thing. Mm. And um, uh, but the silos uh, are still there, and it's it's uh, it'll take some time. Mm. But if you were to go back and see, you know, there are a lot of Nobel laureates of Indian uh, background who got Nobel prizes, but they got them after they came here, mm. not in India. Mm. You see. So the environment makes a heck of a difference. Why do people come and flood to the shores of Canada and America? Because of the, the culture and the values we hold. We say all men are created equal. You don't have the silos. We still do here too, right? I mean, because I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and, and the first thing that people would ask me there is, uh, where did you come from and when are you going back? You see? You still have pockets, but but generally, I would say, America's culture and its work ethic and its values, it promotes hard work. Uh, so it breaks down those silos. Mm. And I'm very grateful for that. And why do Indians come here? Uh, when I look at my class, uh, when, you know, about 54% in the, in the evening MBA program or weekend MBA program are Indian. Mm. 
Why is that? Is because why do people come here? It's it's opportunity. Mm. It means there's something there in that country that does not give the same privileges and potential to grow as here. Mm. Do you see that changing in the world, or do you do you foresee for the next ten, twenty, thirty, forty years, a couple of generations that the U.S. will most likely be that place where people who are looking for those opportunities, who can tell within themselves they have the energy and capacity to become something better than they were, to make a better life for themselves, that this will be the place that they'll want to come? I think the United States will continue to be the place it will be uh, uh, for a long time to come because even though our foundations uh, has weakened significantly and we have uh, you know, fraud going on in this country too, but if you look, compare that to the corruption that happens in India and mm. Russia and China, mm. it's uh, we're like angels. Mm. If you could be king for the day of the United States and t- tweak some of the cultural elements of the country or policies or corruption, as you mentioned, what 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 would you change to make the land of opportunity even more fair and equitable and, and open to people around the world? I think I would return to the values that were established by the founding fathers of the United States. I think they were great. Uh, Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, they didn't believe in getting into debt. They actually paid off uh, uh, the debt they incurred in, during to fight a war in that same generation. They didn't pass it on to the kids. Mm. They felt if you were to go into debt, I think Benjamin Franklin said, it, you lose credibility and you become a slave. And, uh, and what we fought for, in, in essence, what they were saying is, is to be uh, free from slavery. And why do we want to get back into that? And I think today, I think we, as a nation, we are really indebted. Uh, we don't save. Um, and uh, if the United States were to maintain its leadership, I think it will have to uh, foster better education to, to the children. But even, even beyond that, I think foster better values so the family unit is stronger. Uh, Gen Y, I heard that a good chunk of Gen Y grows up in a single family home where the mother is the main provider, mm. right? It's a tremendous burden on, on a lot of women who are very dedicated to their families. And you have men who have abdicated a lot of the responsibility for whatever reason, right? Mm. So we need to understand the root of the problem uh, and fix that versus dealing with these branches and trimming the tree. Uh, of, uh, you know, printing money and, uh, you know, putting that program. Let us assess what is the root of the problem. I think the root of the problem is that we need a good foundation where children and families could uh, to, could grow up and, and be strong there. Mm-hmm. Do you see the debt issue now to be resolvable, that that's something that with a cultural shift, with a change of mentality, or maybe it's already happening, that that's something that Americans are waking up to the a desire to save more or to be more responsible financially how do you how do you see the future most likely unfolding for america in that in that regard well i think uh, the debt problem is uh, so huge uh, it's like uh, you drive in the fog for so long and go so dark so deep that you don't even if you want to turn back you don't even know how to turn back and have a return mm. Uh, I think this debt is that issue. What keeps the United States still at the helm and be as, as strong as we are? Uh, if it is another country in a similar situation with this debt problem, it would be gone. What keeps us there is still our strong values that we held we, because the world still looks, us, looks at us as uh, referees to govern and to be a kind of a... Uh, to go between and to settle matters. I think we still have that credibility. We also have the world's largest army. Mm. And uh, so people feel that they're protected when they invest here Mm. uh, because you don't want to put your money in a a country that would just disappear the next day. Mm. 
So the, having the world's largest army, as much as I don't believe in war, as much as I don't believe in armaments and building those up, but still we are a fortress. Mm. And uh, that gives that, that security. And plus we're also a rational country. We won't pull, you know, we don't bomb somebody for no reason, mm. even though people have an impression, that, well, we bombed Iraq and so on. But, those are, uh, but, I, uh, but, but we're still uh, pretty rational mm. in terms of making decisions. I think that's what will keep us going for the long run. But I think we still need uh, um, uh, some structural changes in how we educate uh, our people in terms of uh, saving, uh, being in better stewardship of resources, not to waste things, uh, to give children a full picture and full education. Uh, because it's amazing that I have to teach my kids some history and because they don't know. Uh, you know, I had to tell them, you know, my, my son says, well, when he throws half his chicken away on his plate, you know, he thinks, you know, it, it comes from Safeway and it's 99 cents. And I said, son, that's not true. The farmer worked very hard for it. The truck driver drove it all the way. You know, an average plate of food travels a thousand miles before it comes and sits on your thing. So much energy, the real cost of that is far greater than 99 cents. Mm. So those kinds of education and perceptions mm. of uh, managing the Earth's resources are very vital, and I don't think we don't give that kind of education. Mm. Last question I, w- I want to ask you. Do, you. do you view technology, I know you work in innovation, you work for the School of Business. Do you view innovation and technology as the great hope for that educational uprising to inform people about how one should live responsibly in the world? Technology and innovation is a two-edged sword. There's a great side where it can improve wealth on corporate balance sheets, take us to the heights, give us a great lifestyle. It has a dark side, which is equally bad. An individual today has more power at his disposal than the pharaoh of Egypt. Two or three individuals can, can do so much damage to the world that all the good people of the world, even though they have, they have the global agenda, what have you, will be remaining powerless. Mm. Look at uh, the, the the twin, the towers, right? Built by so many, took so long and to build those things and so much business was done, but it was brought down by a few people overnight, right? And that can happen to lots of things. So I think we live in the most dangerous world right now than at any other time in history. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us on the show today, Solomon. (laughs) All right. Thanks for listening. If you're interested in learning more about The Exchange, want to listen to episodes online, or would like to reach out to the show, feel free to visit the show's website at theexchangeshow.com. Thank you.